Some of you know we've been going through a series on the book of Hebrews, and we're coming now to the end of a section, the end of chapter 2. In fact, this is the last verse of chapter 2, and this whole section has been dealing with the supremacy of Christ. The whole book is on that topic, topic, but specifically we're considering the place of Christ over the angels and, of course, his superiority to them, and that Christ is superior in that he is a merciful and faithful high priest who had a nature like ours. And that's what distinguishes him. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Now, Through the millennia, God's people have found great comfort in this fact that Jesus, who is fully man, was able to identify with his people, sympathize with his people, and yet remain faithful to God even to the point that he was without sin. Now remember the context here. These Jewish Christians there who were being persecuted. They were being tempted. They were being tempted to leave their faith because it was getting hard. It wasn't very popular. And the good news is they have a merciful priest who was faithful in resisting the spirit of his age. Remember, Jesus came up against a lot of opposition And so we too have to live in the consolation that Jesus knows where we're at. When we stand with him and for him, Christ stood first for us. And so now we have to own our day and our age. Now we're living in strange times and you've got to admit it. Um, We've seen the heresy, right? We call it the The idea of expressive individualism is what it's called. And so apparently now, everybody must be allowed to be their authentic self. And they're encouraged that they just need to follow their heart. Well, how is that ideology paid off? Now that we've been living in this now for a season, just this week, We saw a male boxer pretending to be a woman beating up women in the Olympics in prime time. Is that not just in your face? This is what this insanity is all about. What has it produced in the minds and the hearts of young people? We know there's an epidemic of self-harm and depression because of the foolishness that we have inculcated in our schools. Thankfully, we have an answer to all of this, don't we? Jesus promises us something, that if we will come to him, he will take our heart, that old, deceitful, stony heart, and give us a heart of flesh. See, when you you come to Christ... Not only do you regain your mind, because in sin you go crazy. In sin you're irrational. You are not living in your right mind, but not only is your mind restored, God restores your heart. So as Christians then, even though we've experienced all this and and we're grateful for what God has done, every person who's been born again has been changed, their heart has been transformed. And yet, even in that state, we still have to resist temptations. So today, we'll see how temptations work in the Christian life. Where they arise from, and then how God helps you to overcome them. Amen? Amen? So let's get some practical help today. The source of your temptations. This isn't hidden knowledge. This is right on the surface of the scriptures. Where do all these temptations come from? I'm glad you asked. James 1. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I'm sure that's very familiar to most of you. I had the advantage very early in my Christian walk to memorize the first chapter of James. I commend that to you. And this was an important truth I needed to get as a young believer. Here in the Bible, even though you are a Christian, there remains in you what I would call a veritable weed garden. A weed garden of sin that has taken root in our heart. Now, that doesn't mean we're not forgiven. Yes, we are forgiven, but there remains that weed bed. Now, it's not to say that God can't intervene instantly and immediately deliver you from certain sins. I experienced that. We know of people that have experienced that. We know people who have been instantly set free from addictions. Alcoholics have been set free. Drug addicts, all sorts of things, instantly delivered from those temptations. And that's wonderful, and it's great. Yet, according to James here, there remains in every Christian certain sinful desires. The word there is epithemias in the Greek. Now, that word for desire can be used either way, good or bad, and it can either be a rightly ordered desire or a sinful, disordered desire. But in the New Testament, when this word epithemia is used, the overwhelming use of epithemia is in respect to man's evil desires, and many times you'll see it translated lust, if you have an old King James Bible, you'll see it translated concupiscence, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So, what do we know? For man to, to sin, then, he doesn't just need to be outwardly tempted, tempted by the world, or the, as we call it, the Flip Wilson theology. Remember that? The devil made me do it. No. Why? Because there remains enough of the vestiges of sin in you that you're glad to do evil. Because it's in your desires, your own desires. And this inward disposition is called different things in the Bible. You, this should be familiar. In John 3, this is what Jesus said, flesh is born of flesh, but spirit is born of spirit. So you see the juxtaposition between flesh and and spirit. Ephesians 4.22, put off the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So in Christ, we are to put on the new man and we are to put off the old man. In Romans 7, and I commend this to your Lord's Day reading today, read Romans 7 slowly and carefully. What does Paul say? He says, I see another law in my members, that is in his body, in his, the body of his flesh, and what is it called? The law, or the principle, or the power of sin. That's original corruption that remains in you and draws you toward particular sins. Sins in your mind, sins in your body, sins of your soul. So this eternal struggle is real, and every Christian is experiencing it. And by the way, um, what's interesting about it, that Paul confesses in, in Romans 7, that when he comes in contact with the law of God, what does it do? It actually stirs up the sin. Right? I didn't know not to covet till I heard thou shalt not covet. And then what happened? That came alive in him. And isn't that human nature? The first time somebody tells you, you better not do that, what do we say on the inside? 
oh, watch me, right? There's just that little latent rebellious spirit. So God says, do not covet. And then covetousness is awakened. And your old sin nature then is characterized by your old nature and the old antagonisms that you had with God even before you were saved. That's described in Romans 8, verse 5 through 8. So that just comes alive in us. And so as people have said, this is the lodestone. This is the origin. That old nature is from which all of our sins proceed. John Calvin commenting on this kind of sum, summarizes uh, the views of the day, and he says, There remains in man a smoldering ember of evil from which desires continually leap forth and allure and spur him to commit sin. Believers are yet so bound up by that disease of concupiscence, that is, evil desires, they cannot withstand being at times tickled and enticed to lust or to avarice or to ambition or to other vices. Is that not true in our experience? And this is not for sissies. This is real. This is intense. And if you've not experienced it, then I wonder if you're even saved. Before you're a Christian, you don't care. Because you're, you're wholly given over to the flesh and to the world. But now that you're alive in Christ, what do we see? Paul describes it this way in Galatians 5. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the, there's our word, epithemia, the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, so there's this intense fight, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another. And then this, isn't this our reality? So that you do not do the things that you wish. That's the Christian life. It is a war. And if you're not engaged in the war, then I wonder if you're a Christian. Because this is the battle. So what are we supposed to do about this preacher? If this is really going on, what do I do about this old nature and about these old desires? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing you have to do is accept responsibility. Seems pretty obvious. Notice what James teaches us. Each one of us is tempted when he's drawn away by what? His own desires and is enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So what do we know in this life? Regretfully. We've all sinned against other people, and other people have sinned against us. Welcome to reality. And sadly, some have experienced more sin more abuse or neglect than others, and that's lamentable. And I know, as a pastor, it takes time for people to work through that, process it, and get over it. But, at some point, you have to stand up and stop making excuses for our sin because somebody did something bad to me. What do we know? And this is... This is indisputable sociological facts. That people who have been victimized more often than other people grow up to do what? Become victimizers. So how do we break this vicious cycle? Jesus taught us to pray for God to forgive us. What do we just pray? As we forgive those who've sinned against us. Take responsibility. Stop blame shifting. Stop scapegoating. And own your own sinful desires for what they are. 
That's why he says this, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. They were blaming God for their problems. Remember, the initial spark of evil comes from what? The smoldering embers in our own heart. And we have to own that. It begins a, a, a pernicious process whereby a man is drawn away by his own desires. Imagine going out camping. We like to have our little men's fire out here. And what do we do? We, put, we have this dry kindling there. And then have you ever tried to light a fire with a flint knife, right? And you, you bang against the rock and the spark goes in to the tender, uh, dry, uh, and you find eventually that if you blow on it just nicely enough and you can tend to it, all of a sudden you can get a fire going. But if you're not careful, what can you do? <laughs> that fire will burn the whole camp down, right? What we have to own is the spark of sin isn't the world, it isn't the devil, it's in us. And we have to own that. And we have to own the fact that we will coddle that spark. Because it's our own desires that leads us. It's not the devil. It's not the world. So the, and then the process is described as conception. So the spark, once it's tendered, conceives, matures, and then and only then do we see the deadly fruit of it in a person's actions. So why is this important? I'll get to that in a moment. So sin itself was present long before the impulses were outwardly acted upon. You need, and this is what I'm concerned about today. This is being denied. And this is what we have to confront. I don't have time to take you back to the Reformation, but this was one of the great debates and one of the great things that distinguished Protestant Christianity from Roman Catholic theology. Catholicism says, you're only guilty of a sin if you act on it. And that's not what we believe. It's not correct. And unfortunately, this is coming into the church. And you know why? in order to accommodate the alphabet mafia. And you know what I'm talking about. They're not willing to tell people you have to take responsibility for your own sinful desires. But the Bible calls it to us, calls us to it. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 28? But I say to you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust, there's our word, epithemia, for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's basic. Everybody knows that verse. God looks on the heart. And he's not simply interested in outward conformity to the law. Now, you may have never acted. Maybe you've never committed adultery. But for some of you, the only reason you haven't acted is because you've lacked opportunity. You know it's true. So the lack of acting doesn't make you virtuous. God wants truth in the inward parts. That's why Louis Burkhoff, one of the great systematic theo theologians of our generation, put it this way. Listen to his definition of sin. It's very specific. But we, I want you to think with me today. Sin may be defined as any lack of conformity to the moral law of God. Let's call that the Ten Commandments. Either how? In act. So obviously we don't break it in our actions. But also in our dispositions. That is our desire. Do we want to break them if we could get away with it? Or state. State. State of what? Not state of California. State of being. Our state of being. 
That's an interesting definition. So sin is an action. Sin can be a disposition. Or we can be in a sinful state of nature. And we have to own that. This is our sin, right? And if it's our sin, it's our responsibility. My actions, my disposition, and my nature, I have to own it and call it what it is. This has always been the case. This isn't something new to the New Testament. God's always wanted our heart. In Exodus 20, verse 17, the tenth commandment, you shall not what? Covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So the Ten Commandments isn't just about outward conformity. It's about inward conformity from your heart. God wants us to sincerely love Him, sincerely love our neighbor, and that means we have to have rightly ordered motives. Rightly ordered desires and rightly ordered actions. I hope you're seeing how this applies to our day. So, you're to do what is right for the right reasons and desire only what God approves. Right? It's that simple. Remember Paul speaking to the Corinthians says, even if you offer up your body to be burned, you know, the, the consummate act of self-sacrifice, right? If you have not what? Love. It profits you nothing. So outward actions, even outward sacrificial actions from the wrong motive profit you nothing. So the first and foremost thing that should consume us as believers is that we want to glorify and please God and you cannot do that while you're coddling your lusts. We have to own it for what it is. And this world is going further and further insane. So what do we do? And let me encourage you to do this. Don't read current theologians because they're swimming in this world and they're being corrupted by this culture. So if, to, to get help, sometimes it's helpful. Why don't we go back before woke culture ever impacted the church? And the good news is, we have those resources available to us. One is the Westminster Confession of Faith. And they thought long and hard about this. So I want to read this to you. But let's honor our fathers in the faith, these men of God who were wrestling with the Word, to try to benefit from their wisdom. What do they have to say about this issue? This corruption of our nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated. We just said that. Even Christians are struggling with this. And although it be, through Christ, pardoned, what does that deal with? Our justification. And mortified, put to death. That deals with our sanctification. Yet, both the corruption itself and the motions or the activities thereof are truly and properly sin. Now think about that. The motions of it, that's our desires. Sin. The, it's properly called that. So that's good because now that we know what it is, thankfully we, know, we have a biblical response for it. We're not just subject to our desires. Every sin both original sin and actual sins, being a transgression of the righteous law of God and contrary thereunto, thus in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner. So we have to own our nature. We have to own our actions. And we have to call it what it is and not qualify for that. We have churches telling people, you can come into our church, but you don't have to give up your perverted desires. Because the desire is not sin as long as you don't act on it. Well, I'm 
Sorry to say, that's not biblical. We must call our our old nature what it is. It's sinful. Paul called it the law of sin. We must call our actions what it is. So by the grace of God then, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we put on Christ. And we pick up our cross daily, we're told, and we mortify these stubborn, sinful desires. We'll come back to that in a moment. But our God is compassionate. We have a merciful high priest who's dealt with our condition. He knows what you're going through. And so he can have compassion, Hebrews 5, on those who are ignorant. There are people who just didn't know this, or they're being misled. And those who are going astray, since he understands he's been himself subject to weakness in his flesh. So as you grow, as you grow as a Christian, You grow in the grace of God, and what do you learn as you grow as a Christian? First of all, you learn more about who God is, and the more you learn about God, the higher He goes in your estimation, hopefully. And we we see Him in the beauty of His holiness, and we gain a greater and greater appreciation of who God is. Simultaneously, you learn more about yourself especially about that dark side of our own nature, the the nooks and crannies, if you will, where we still coddle our sin and our pride and our envy and our lust. And that comes more to light as well. So God calls us to truth, to sincere love, which culminates in conformity to his holy nature. Remember, the Pharisees fastidiously obeyed the law. But Jesus said their hearts were far from God. There's a lot of outwardly whitewashed sepulchers. A lot of them are in church this morning. Not particularly our church, but maybe you. Outwardly religious. They look good. They know the right words to say. But when push comes to shove, they're inwardly, spiritually dead. So, what's the good news? Well, praise God for the gospel, right? Good news for sinners because in Christ, all of my sin has been forgiven. And my sin nature has been transformed. So God's righteousness, you have become the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's true about you. And that speaks to your justification. We affirm all of that today. That's why we come to the table of the Lord, to celebrate that. And God declares that you are righteous. But guess what? You are to grow in righteousness. So that everything that God declares about you, that He declares you righteous, becomes realized more and more progressively in your life on an experiential level. We call that the doctrine of sanctification. A lot of churches don't want to preach that now. They just want to reaffirm your justification. Yes, you need to know you're justified in Christ, but you are called to grow and grow in holiness And that includes those deepest, darkest desires of our heart. So let me conclude with some practical application. But pastor, the heart wants what it wants. Right? That's what we are told. And somehow that's supposed to legitimize what they want. Well, there's a problem. This is what Jesus says about your heart. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Wow. That's the truth about the human heart. So spiritual progress has to be made, but trust me, it has to be made through spiritual warfare. Not apathy, and certainly not by playing footsies with your sin and excusing it. Why? Because sin kills. Sin kills. And you have to take it seriously. Jesus says if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. But you cannot play games with sin. 
It's deadly. And I don't care if they give it a parade and wrap it up in rainbows, it's still deadly sin. Oh, but pastor, and here's another heresy that's coming into the church. All sins are the same though, pastor. Why are you just picking on that sin? Well, I don't know any other sins that have a parade. But aren't all sins the same? Well, let me answer that with an unequivocal yes and no. <laughs> yes in one respect and absolutely not in other respects. So what do we know about sin? Just one sin against an infinitely holy God renders you and me infinitely guilty and worthy of hell. Or maybe you don't have the right understanding of who it is you're sinning against. So in that respect, yes, just one sin is enough to damn me. But that's not how the Bible treats sin entirely. There's more to the story. But no, they're not treated the same. So I'm going to say some things slowly. They're kind of dense. You may want to write them down in case you don't have it. For example, all biblical crimes... Can you think of some of the crimes that are mentioned in the Bible? All biblical crimes are sins. But not all sins are crimes. God made a distinction. What do you mean by that, Pastor? For example, we don't prosecute somebody who has an unjust anger towards his brother, even though Jesus condemns it, that it's the same as, as murder, but we don't prosecute it. We don't treat the attitude as something that's a crime, but we do righteously execute someone if they've been justly convicted of the act of murder. That's taught in the Scripture. So, again, there's a difference between the attitude and the action, and thank God uh, that we don't get prosecuted for our attitudes. Amen? Amen? But remember this as well. When God gets ready to administer justice, is He unjust to the degree that He's going to treat all sins the same? You think He's going to treat mass murderers in hell the same way He treats other people who were not mass murderers? No. The Bible talks about degrees of rewards, and the Bible talks about degrees of punishments. And there will be degrees of punishment in hell. And so, no, God does not treat all sins the same. Again, let's resort to the Westminster Divines. What did they have to say about this? In the larger catechism, question 150, it says this, Are all transgressions of the law of God equally heinous in themselves, and in the sight of God. And what's the answer? Some sins in themselves, by reason of several aggravations, are more heinous in the sight of God than others. Don't you think God's going to treat people who commit sins against children a little bit differently than he might commit other sins? We know. Jesus said it would be better for you to be cast into the sea and have a millstone tied around your neck than to cause any of these little ones to stumble. He makes distinctions. Some sins, by reason of their aggravation, are singled out. And we should single them out as well. We're not doing one, anybody any favor by telling them all sins are the same. And yet that's going on in the churches around us. Let's see what 2 Peter has to say about sexual problems because that's what this is all about the lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials amen is that a, we love that part but it doesn't start stop there and so he rescues the godly and to keep the unrighteous under punishment 
Amen? Where's my ameners now? And to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and notice, and especially. What? And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion. I don't want to get into all of that, but you know what we're talking about. Especially. So there are distinctions. And we need not succumb to the lies of moral equivalency when it says, when people go around saying that all sins are the same. They're not. And if you're saying that, you need to stop saying that. And you need to be be honest enough to tell people the truth. So what is the conclusion, Pastor? When your heart desires what God's forbid... What do we do? We're to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And by the grace of God, you can't do this in your strength. You've got to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then you submit yourself to God. Not only are you resisting the devil, you're resisting those impulses inside of you. And when you hear the lie, when you hear the temptation, when you're being drawn away, you have to stand up and call it what it is. It's a lie. It's a sin. And what do you do? You replace the lie with the truth by affirming God's law and God's gospel. That's why the psalmist said this, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. I have restrained my feet from the evil way. See what the law does? that I may keep your word. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Hatred for sin is righteousness to God. So, church, let's be a little sober-minded today. Why? Because the wages of sin always leads to death of some kind. Spiritual death because it disenfranchises you in your relationship with God. Relational death, it estranges you from the people that you've sinned against, obviously. Emotional, it's depressing when you commit sins. It's shameful. It's death. Sin always causes death. Whether anybody else knows about it or not, God knows about it, you know about it, and there's a death that takes place. Disobedience is not the pathway to happiness. Disobedience is essentially suicidal. It's self-destructive, and it's on the way to hell. And what does sin always do? It always rips us off. It always promises that, oh, if we just do this, we'll be happy or we'll we'll have pleasure. And, And yeah, you may have it for a moment, but it always, in the end, rips you off and it costs you more than you ever bargained for. It's never worth it. It's like the prodigal who foolishly left his father's home and then where does he end up? Living with the pigs. That's where sin will take you every time. So even if no one else knows it, you know it, and the Holy Spirit knows it. And when you grieve the Holy Spirit, you're ashamed. So what's the antidote? We must abide in Christ. We must walk in the Spirit. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, are you abiding in Christ and His Spirit? As soon as the spark then of sin combusts, we have to renounce it. We have to confess it as sin and a lie. And then replace it. Douse these worldly desires by setting your affections on Christ. Setting your affections on the things that are above. Because at the end of the day, sin is misplaced affection. You are loving 
a lie. You are loving your lust. So you cannot love God and love sin. So sin is a love problem. And may God, by His grace, help us to love Him. And what is the great promise of God then? If we will walk in the light, as He is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. We have to walk in light. That means being honest, being honest with ourselves, And not allowing sin to destroy you and have power over you. You say, Pastor, I'm stuck in a sin. Okay. Then come and talk to us. We'll help you. That's why you have a church. That's why you have brothers and sisters. That's why you have pastors and elders. You don't, this isn't necessarily your own battle to fight on your own. If we are encouraged in James to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. You have to do that wisely, but that's available to you. So please, please, don't play with sin. Don't give in to the the desires. Don't rationalize and justify. Come and let us walk with you and help you. And the promise of Hebrews 2.18 is Jesus, your merciful and faithful high priest, is able to... And he is willing to aid all of you who are being tempted. Amen? Let's pray.